Do your emotions get the better of you sometimes? Do you feel that you're always at the mercy of fear, sadness, or anger? Do your emotional reactions to situations often get you in trouble or cost you your relationships? Are you tired of feeling defeated, feeling taken advantage of, feeling confused or unable to express yourself? Do you wish you could just move through life confident of your ability to set healthy boundaries with other people without damaging your relationships? The Emotional Reset Program will help answer these questions and more. This two-day program is designed to help you understand how emotions work and how you can use them to interact with yourself and others in a more meaningful way. Let's begin the journey together towards a better, more confident you. Welcome to Hero Ed TV Good Friday webinar specials. I am Bryce Fabro, the chair and founder of Hero Summit and also the co-program director of the Emotional Reset Program. In today's episode, we all shall see and understand our emotions in a different way. It is our goal to help schools help their teachers, especially in offering support for maintaining emotional well-being and promoting mental health. The question we have to answer today is, how do we support teachers' emotional needs right now? This was the question that Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence has answered as they unpack emotional lives of teachers during the COVID-19 crisis. The impact study that came after became the guiding light of Emotional Reset as a program designed by Bryce Inspired Careers. Emotional Reset, or what we call ER, catapults from the focus on the study done by Yale Center on how emotions drive effective teaching and learning, the decisions educators make, classrooms and school climate, and educators' well-being. It asserts that educators' emotions matter for five primary reasons. Number one, emotions matter for attention, memory, <laughs> and learning. All right. Can you hear me, everyone? Am I audible? All right, good. Positive emotions like joy and curiosity harness attention and promote greater engagement. Emotions like anxiety and fear, especially when prolonged, disrupt concentration and interfere with thinking. Number two, emotions matter for decision making. When we're overwhelmed and feeling scared and stressed, the areas of our brains responsible for wise decision, wise decision making can, be, can become hijacked. Number three, emotions matter for relationships. How we feel and how we interpret the feelings of others send signals for other people to either approach or avoid us. Teachers who express anxiety or frustration, for example, in their facial expressions, their body language, their vocal tone, or their behavior are likely to alienate students, which can impact students' sense of safety in the classroom and likely at home in a virtual learning environment thereby having a negative influence on learning. Number four, emotions matter for health and well-being. How we feel influences our bodies, including physical and mental health. Stress is associated with increased levels of cortisol, which has been shown to lead to both physical and mental health challenges, including depression and weight gain. Lastly, emotions matter for performance. Chronic stress among teachers is linked to decreases in teachers' motivation and engagement, both of which lead to burnout. Teachers who are, um, you know, teachers that have poorer relationships with students are also less likely to be positive role models for healthy 
self-regulation for their students and for their families. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I have invited my co-director for this program, Dr. Brenda Valenzuela Fortune, to join me as we unravel Emotional Reset, an HR responsive program for teachers' emotional well-being. Dr. Fortune is a psychotherapist at, Pen uh, at Peninsula Psychological Center and a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Washington, USA. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Brenda in the house. All right. Thank you so much, Bryce, for that welcome. Dr. Brenda, how are you? What time is it there? Oh, it's, um, let me see, it's 8. It's 8 p.m. It's Thursday right now. Oh, right. here. <laughs> and it's yeah. Good Friday here in the Philippines. Thank you so much for making time. I know that um, you're excited as, as, as I am. Uh, we're doing this for the first time, uh, at least for this kind of platform right now, where we are uh, showcasing a program that we just recently cooked. And I'd like Absolutely. you to help me out in um, sharing what this emotional reset is all about before okay. we, go, we go down to the Q&A. Doc Brenda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bryce. And it's definitely an honor and privilege for me to be with you tonight. Um, so many educators and administrators who are making a huge difference in young people's lives today. And to me, you are the real heroes. Like um, Dr. Bryce has said, you know, our focus today is on emotional reset. And um, also what I call learning to speak the language of emotions, like uh, Carla McLaren says in her book, uh, The Language of Emotions. So the objective of this, of this overview, if I may say, this is actually an overview of the two-day seminar that we will be um, offering beginning of at the end of April. And we will be able to also offer the seminar uh, asynchronously in the months to come. So I would like to talk first about what emotions are and maybe have a little definition of what it is. One of the, the things that we are going to talk about in the seminar is the anatomy of emotions and where did they come from? Well, attempts have been made to explain the origins of emotion or the origin of emotions from the psychological or the neurobiological perspectives. Um, but so far, there's still a little bit of confusion or maybe disagreement in that area. But one of the main questions that, that is asked is a question, are emotions and feelings the same? You know, where do emotions come from? Are we, are we born with emotions? Do our emotions come from our thoughts? and instincts, or is it the other way around? Um, so those kinds of questions have not really been settled, but these are some of the things that we know about emotions now. Okay, humans experience emotions every single moment. And I was, well, I was watching the video of Jesus being crucified. I felt a lot of different emotions while watching that. So we experienced it, experience emotion a lot every single moment. And the other thing that we know is that emotions are what make us human. You, emotions are very, very essential to our ex existence because without emotions, we would not be able to form meaningful relationships in our lives. Uh, emotions allow us to fall in love. Emotions allow us to enjoy one another. Um, however, emotions can also be main a main source of pain and suffering in our lives too. For example, quarrels and um, divorces, separations, family strife uh, can be traced to some emotional upheavals or turmoil. Um, the other thing that we know about emotions is that most of the time we don't know what to do about them. So we either run away from them, we either suppress them, we fight them or we get scared of them. So the emotions are very powerful, but they cannot harm us. They can only inform us of what is going on inside of us. Some, the question of how many emotions do people have? 
Well, that is again uh, a point of contention among researchers because some researchers um, say that there are four major emotions, anger, sadness, joy, and fear. Well, other researchers say that there are six uh, universal ones, anger, sadness, fear, joy, disgust, and surprise. I've also read some um, uh, research material that says that there are 27 different emotions. All other emotions are gradients or subcategories of the major ones. Uh, from my point of view, I prefer the four, the, the first category, four major emotions. So emotions are what some people uh, call energy in motion, emotions, energy in motions, because they push us to action. Um, I'm sure that you have experienced uh, an emotional situation in, in your life where you have to take action, you know, and how did you do in that situation? Have you ever been in a situation where your emotions got you or someone else in, in trouble? I, I'm sure in my situation, it has. Um, so this is something about emotions. This is something interesting about emotions. They come up because of the meaning that we assign to a situation. So I am going to give you this example of a client of mine. There are a couple. Um, the wife text, texted her husband and he did not reply right away. So her first thought was, he is ignoring me. And then that thought turned into an emotion of sadness and anger, which in turn, turned into a behavior. He gave him the cold shoulder all, all night. And then of course, the negative outcome of that was lost joy in their relationship. So if she had been an emotionally fit person, she would have thought of another explanation why her husband did not text her. Maybe he was delayed at work or maybe he went to pick up some groceries. So an emotionally fit person wouldn't have reacted that way and the day would have been saved for this couple. One of the things that emotional reset curriculum uh, addresses is the difference between response and reaction. And we will, we will uh, talk about that in a little bit, but there is between stimulus and response, there is a very tiny space. And what we choose to do in that tiny space can create the difference between peace and turmoil in our life. So in emotional reset, we need to learn to respond to situations instead of react to them. Um, it takes an emotionally fit person to be able to respond appropriately to any given situation and any given circumstance. Um, so how does an emotionally fit person Look, emotional fitness uh, can also be called emotional intelligence or emotional maturity. So what does an emotionally uh, fit and mature person look like? Well, number one, a person who is emotionally fit is able to work through emotional ups and downs of everyday life. Number two, an emotionally fit person rarely gets upset or derailed. And when he does, he's able to recalibrate or reset himself back to emotional balance or equilibrium very quickly. Uh, the third characteristic is he has tools to self-soothe or self-regulate when uh, he feels that there's something off uh, with him emotionally. And then number four, he is able to read other people's emotions and adjust her emotions accordingly and appropriately. Number five is uh, a person who is emotionally fit is comfortable feeling emotions and is able to use them as data to improve himself and other people. Also, an emotionally fit person is able to ask for what he needs and able to bring things up that are difficult or challenging. 
In other words, a person who is emotionally fit is able to respond, not react. Of course, for this to happen, uh, you must first have the courage to face your emotional loss and be willing to change. So this first part is what we call awareness of what is going on. Being able to create a map, an internal map of what's going on. This will require a lot of reflection on your part. And then you can also train yourself to become emotionally fit by practicing habits to create different ways of thinking and doing. And we, we will talk more about that, the connection between your thought life and your emotional life. Um, in time, you will be able to master your emotions and live a more successful and more um, enjoyable and more satisfying life. So another thing that we're going to talk about in Emotional Reset, uh, the, the seminar, is about high emotionality. Because you might be thinking, you know, uh, I, I, you might have met other people who are extremely emotional or they have high reactivity. Well, there is a segment where we talk about it's not always your fault when that happens. You know, there are some uh, disorders that may predispose you to emotional sensitivity or emotional uh, reactivity. And some of these, uh, these uh, conditions may be causing higher emotional reactions than, than normal. And I'm just gonna give you an example. If you are suffering from a mood disorder, for instance, if you have a major depressive disorder or you have any of the anxiety disorders, then you might be more sensitive to your environment and more sensitive to other people's um, uh, actions toward you. So if this is the situation with, with you where you are unable, you know, despite all of the things that you're doing to control your emotions, that you're, you're still uh, not having any luck with that, maybe it's a good idea uh, to consult a phys physician about that because what's going on with you might be physiological. Okay. Uh, or see a counselor or maybe a, a therapist. Um, sometimes hormones can also cause you to have uh, in, extreme emotional reactions. You've heard of uh, postpartum depression that can, can cause uh, emotional reactivity as well. Um, so sometimes it's not always your fault. That, that is the, the whole point of that segment. Now let's talk about how the way that you, you uh, think can change the way how you feel. In cognitive behavioral therapy, the, the one of the therapy approaches that I use in my practice, uh, we trace a, a lot of the um, emotional upheaval from, from uh, the thought life of a person. What you're thinking impact the way that you behave and how you behave. Uh, I mean, the impact the way that you feel and how you feel impacts the way that you behave. And then how you behave impacts the way that you think. And so it becomes a vicious cycle. Fortunately, we have what we call a, the, the concept of neuroplasticity, where this is the, the brain's ability to form and reorganize uh, synaptic connections in your brain uh, to give you a different uh, to create a different response, uh, to help you learn new skills, uh, new mental skills and learn new experiences. So you can change the way that you feel by changing the way that you think. As mentioned earlier, uh, the way that you feel de depends on how you interpret or choose to assign meaning to a situation. So uh, I'm going to give you an example. So, for example, you see your fellow teacher walking down the street and then you, you're friends with this teacher. So you wave at, at this teacher and then he doesn't wave back. How would you interpret that situation? Um, would you say he totally ignored me, he doesn't like me? Or, you know, oh my goodness, you know, who? Why, why, why did they do it? Are they angry at me? You know, you can, you can go through all sorts of scenarios in your head and then pretty soon you're either angry person or, or uh, sad or anxious, you know, and those are negative emotions. 
we call them negative emotions because they most of the time they result in negative outcomes. But in reality, emotions are neither uh, neither good nor bad. They they just are. That's one of the the things that we know about emotions. So um, so how do we how do we uh, talk about or approach neuroplasticity then? How how do we um, put that into practice? Well, one way is to be aware of your thought life. You know, mindfulness is a good thing to do. Think about what you're thinking about and then write it down. You know, find a pattern. Is it negative or positive? Do you normally shift to the negative aspect of a situation or do you normally default to a um, um, positive? So related to this is being aware of your internal dialogue or what we call, um, you know, the, the inner critic in you, you know, and then be able to change the, the script for that as well. So, and then another way to, uh, to help with, with changing your mind is to purposely put yourself in uncomfortable situations in order to reduce their impact. Uh, we call this systematic desensitization or when you do in vivo exposure where you purposely put yourself in situation. For example, if you have anxiety about meeting new people, you feel nervous about meeting new people, then maybe you can face that fear and go ahead and meet new people. And by doing it a little bit at a time, then you can you can help change your mind regarding that. And of course, practice, practice, practice makes perfect. Um, so another thing that we, we talk about in emotional uh, reset is the, the, of course, the strategies that we will use in order to um, bring ourself, ourselves back to the state of calm. For me, the intent of emotional reset is to bring ourselves back to the state of calm recalibrating, getting back to equilibrium and balance. So I uh, conceptualize it this way, R-E-S-T, you get back to the resting, resting mode of your emotions. R stands for response. How do you respond to a situation? E is expression. You know, how do you express your response? S is going by stabilizing yourself. And then T is achieving tranquility, which is at the end of that process. So um, we have this protocol and I borrowed this from John Boyd, uh, United States Air Force Colonel John Boyd. He was a military strategist, strategist and he came up with this concept of UDA, looping, O-O-D-A, O-O-D-A. So UDA loop is the cycle of observe, orient, decide, and then act. Even though this was originally applied to combat operations process, we can use it to help in emotional resetting. For example, if you come up, uh, you, you have a situation at hand, um, instead of reacting, you can do the OODA loop, OODA looping in your head. First, you observe what's happening in the situation. What is the situation going on? You know, what, what is it? What are the emotions that I am dealing with right now? Okay. Uh, Dr. Gottman, uh, who is um, a psychologist and researcher here at the University of Washington, calls that emotion embracing. You, know, you embrace the emotions that you're feeling at the moment. Um, and Brene Brown, who also is a researcher and an expert in, in the language of emotions, in my opinion, calls it embracing the suck, <laughs> you know, just embrace what is going on at the time. So that is the observe part of the OODA loop. This is the information gathering stage. For instance, you know, your boss is angry and you're having anxiety about it, about it. And you feel like you want to get angry as well. So no, that would be the observation part. And then after that is the orient part where you orient yourself to the situation. Be curious about the situation, not furious. Okay. Be curious, not furious. 
So you ask yourself the question, what is it that I am really dealing with at this time? What should I focus on first? Your emotions here can drive you to make a decision that you might regret later. So it's good to stay in this, in this space uh, for a time. So now you have options to, to choose from in this, uh, in this process. You can either walk away, you can yell back, you can punch the boss, you can keep quiet, you can let him rant and rave while you try to soothe yourself. In this stage, you consider all of the options. And then the third part of that looping is the decide part of it, where you decide on which options you would like to pursue. Of course, there should also be only be one option, you know, that is the best, the best course of action for the best possible outcome. Uh, and in this situation, the best course of action would be to remain calm uh, and then try to engage your boss in a meaningful, more meaningful and more productive conversation than what he's already having with you. And then the last part is ACT, A-C-T, act on the decision that you have made. So that is the OODA looping, which we use in the reset strategy or reset, uh, which is which we use as the reset protocol. So having said all that, it's a, a very, very brief and quick overview of uh, emotional reset. My conclusion is, uh, well, I have a few conclusions. One is emotions are neither right nor wrong. You know, they just are. Let's not be afraid of the emotions because they just provide good information of what's going on with us. And then the other thing that I would like to share is what you do with your emotions spells the difference between chaos and order in your life. Nobody wants chaos. We want order. Okay. Another conclusion is we have more control over our emotions than we think that we do. By finding our emotional home, which is the state of calm. I like, I like that terminology, the, your emotional home, where you can find tranquility. You know, where do you go back to to find tranquility? And if you visit the place often, you will experience more joy, peace, and satisfaction in your life. Then uh, the other thing is you will get better and better with time and with practice. So imagine this. Um, Imagine what it would mean for all of us to have an emotionally fit boss, parent, spouse, or coworker. Imagine what it would be like. It would mean better working relationships, right? More productivity, better morale, better health. While it might not be realistic to imagine the whole world being emotionally intelligent, we can be a hero and begin the change starting with us. So my closing is, um, I borrowed this from M. Scott Peck, who is the author of The Road Less Traveled. Um, he said, M. Scott Peck, Peck said, mental health is an ongoing process of dedication to reality at all costs. Now, let me repeat that. Mental health is an ongoing process of dedication to reality at all cost. This includes the reality of our emotions and dedicating our lives to embracing them as part of what makes life worth living for us. Thank you so much for listening. And Dr. Bryce, I give it back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, before we move forward uh, and, and you know, have this discussion and the Q&A between us, uh, Dr. Brenda, we are so happy and grateful because one of the busiest education leaders I know is in the room right now. Thanks to Good Friday, Dr. Mariden is here in our room and she happens to be the vice president of Cagayan Valley Univers State University. So I requested her to share her insights after your presentation and maybe a little reaction. Doc Maridan, welcome and thank you for saying yes to my yes question. <laughs> 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 nice to see you here, Doc. Morning, everyone. 
doctor. Thank you, Dr. Brenda, for uh, enlightening us or uh, giving us some views on emotions and reactions. This must be one of the most uh, unexpected days for me, apart from listening to your lecture or to your presentation. Dr. Bryce is, uh, has just caught me by surprise. By <laughs> <laughs> Emotions and reactions, faculty members, uh, in my case, in my case. admission because uh, I am in a state university, Cagayan State University. At this point, mm -hmm. men or students, unfortunately, are feeling depressed. Why? Um, because of their inability to come up with deadlines, because of poor connectivity and so forth. We are in a state university. I just, for example, uh, got reports from our guidance counselors, like uh, many of our students are having problems on how to deal with deadlines and so forth. Emotions, reactions. I think our faculty members are really uh, in need of such uh, to be able to handle well. You know, from among our clients, our students, really, especially now that um, COVID cases are going up in our area. So these are all um, contributory to the feeling of depression, not only among our faculty, but especially among our students who belong to the poorest, many belong to the poorest of the poor, our institution being a state university. I, I hope uh, we can have a wider range to be able to go down to the level of our students, for example. I hope uh, Dr. Bryce will, will not only cater to them, um, higher bracket like um, professors, faculty members, mm. or our people. But I hope there's something that there is a design also to cater to students for that matter. Um, indeed, the mental health of everyone is one thing at the moment. Uh, in our case, uh, in Cagayan, that's uh, we are very we are under ECQ uh, enhanced quality. For, for the fourth time now, so for 10 days, we are under ECQ. So you can see the depression or you can feel the psychological help of people here. Everybody is stuck in their homes and so forth. So I hope uh, everybody can uh, will get back to their balance and equilibrium, as Dr. Brenda was saying. It's very good input. I hope I, I shall be able also to echo to our community, the academic community at least, for that matter. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, well, of course, maybe I'd like to address the, the first request mentioned uh, on the reaction. Yes, the program that we have designed is catering uh, to A to, uh, from A to Z kind of thing, even in terms of its value, its pricing, and its accommodation in terms of content. So because we all have emotions and we all need to use that for guidance and to regain our vitality. So we have considered that very well. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I know that we're enjoying our time. We would be allowing everyone to listen into our conversation uh, since Dr. Brenda and I co-directed this program. We co-authored this program. So we'll try to let you in using a Q&A between us so that you would understand what is emotional reset design and how it will yeah. benefit the individual and at the same time, the school uh, as a whole. So, Doc Brenda, may I first shoot my first question, please? Of course. Right, okay. My first question, Doc Brenda, is, uh, of course you mentioned about this, but maybe we can just dig it a little deeper. The difference between emotions and feelings, what is it? What makes them very different? Oh, okay. I, yeah, this is a very interesting um, question because we use those two words interchangeably, don't we? Right. Um, and I, I don't mean to split hairs, but <laughs> even though they're used interchangeably, there are a few differences between the two. Let's just say, I, let me just say that to illustrate that emotions are like the ignition in your car mm -hmm. and feelings are the gears. So emotions start you off Right. But the feeling is what keeps you moving. Um, so, because why else do we say, you know, you hurt my feelings instead of you hurt my emotions, Diva? So there has to be some sort of difference. Right. 
And then it's equally okay to say, I have mixed emotions and I have mixed feelings. Right, right. So which one is which? So uh, let me, maybe I can give you a little bit of example too. For example, you're in a good mood, right? Yeah. And then you're going shopping in the grocery store. So you, you, round, you round a corner and then you suddenly spot an old boyfriend <laughs> whom you had an awful breakup with a few months before. So you look at him, he looks back at you, and then you suddenly have this urge to duck and bolt out of the store, a store as fast as you can. What you experienced there was, was that uh, an emotion or was it a feeling? That was, that was the emotion. So emotions are reactions that result from certain chemicals being released in the brain as a result of the stimulus. So in this case, the flight sensation that you felt is an emotion. The stimulus is your ex-boyfriend's face, the external stimulus, right, right. followed by the uh, memory of your unfortunate breakup. Mm -hmm. That's the internal right. uh, stimulus. So even though the emotion is unpleasant, it's normal, right? Mm -hmm. um, the characteristic then of, em of emotion that they trigger the fight or flight or freeze reaction and they are usually transient mm -hmm. they don't last very long but feelings do feelings are more durable and they last longer you know they are more sustained because they are more conscious than emotions are okay emotions are usually unconscious it's the knee-jerk reaction that you get mm -hmm. um, and emotions are usually more intense and feelings are not because with emotions they compel you to act right away. It's like the, 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 the fight, flight, uh, freeze response that I was uh, telling you about earlier. So with feelings though, you can sit with it uh, and, and mull over it and then form a feeling, you know, after a while. But no, we, 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 uh, we these two words are, are usually interchanged and we use them you know, interchangeably all the time. So. It's, it's perfect that we're calling our program Emotional Reset, not Feelings Reset, right? That's right. <laughs> right. Um, Correct. Right, okay. Because emotions are not educated. The way I'm picking it up, right? They're not educated. They're very spontaneous. They're just, you know, they are informed data in, in there, but then they're not very educated. So we reset them. And while we are trying to reset our emotions, it's helping us educate the emotion as well. Am I right, doctor? You are perfectly right. All right. Okay. Now, why is it important um, to discuss or to talk about emotional fitness? Why do we need to talk about it now more than ever? Ah, okay. You mentioned at the beginning of your, your talk, the, the introduction, uh, you mentioned several key points there, uh, Dr. Bryce, why we need that. I mean, emotions teach us a lot of things about ourselves, right? right. Um, you know, uh, and I, as I mentioned before, I mean, all of us, except if you have a disorder, for example, um, all of us experience emotions. It, well, it's necessary. It's necessary to talk about emotional resetting or fitness because they are, it's necessary for healthy relationships. Uh, and as humans, we thrive on that. We are made for connection. Right. And so if we are able to be emotionally fit and reset our emotions in an appropriate way, we will be able to experience better and healthier relationships. Um, it also, you know, talking about this also, it's, it's important to talk about this because um, becoming emotionally fit prevents us from unhelpful emotional feeling fixes sometimes. Uh, what I mean by that is in my practice, you know, I see a lot of people with anxiety and depression and relationship problems. And a lot of times when they come to me, they have already tried a lot of avenues to help reset their emotional life. Mm -hmm. uh, by using alcohol, for instance, or, you know, doing drugs or, um, you know, uh, sex is also one of those fixes. That they have. So if you have a, an unhealthy emotional life, then you can be prone to those emotional fixes mm -hmm. that are not productive or helpful. 
Also, you know, returning your body to a more relaxed state where you can think clearly, releasing good feel feel good hormones. Uh, this is this is a good good way to live, right? Right. right. So I, I heard somebody say right. once that you cannot um, you cannot see clearly in boiling water, right. which right. I think is really wise. You have to turn down the heat first, you know, and let the bubble subside before you can see yourself clearly. So being emotionally uh, fit and healthy can help you get clarity about your situation. And of course, you know, they make, we make better, wiser decisions when we are emotionally whole and we respond better to life challenges. A healthy mind, you know, healthy body, bring more peace to us. So that's why it's good for us to talk about these things. And another thing, uh, Dr. Bryce, I want to point out is that we are, we are socialized, you know, to not talk, discuss about our emotions, especially the difficult ones, mm -hmm. you know, because they are deemed, you know, they are deemed negative, you know, like why, why are you being emotional? Why are you being emo right now or something like that? Because people don't know how to deal with that. And a lot of the, um, what they call this, the dysfunctional families that I see, this is one of the characteristics that they have, that they are unable to talk about their deep emotions. They suppress them or they avoid them. And that causes a lot of turmoil in, in the family and in their relationship. So, so it's good for us to talk about these things. There are people, uh, Doc Brenda, who are, you know, afraid to be vulnerable, right? Since you're talking mm -hmm. You know, it becomes a dysfunction according to Renee Brown. Why do you think so? Why yes. do people find it hard to really be vulnerable? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because, uh, you know, the definition of vulnerability is uh, the state of being exposed right. to yeah. possible harm, yeah. uh, either physically or emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, so the short answer is fear in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, fear of being exposed, yeah. fear of being rejected, uh, fear, fear of being criticized, fear of being judged, fear of ridiculed. Uh, in short, fear of getting hurt, yeah. right? Because when we are vulnerable, we take a risk. And most people are allergic to, to risks <laughs> because vulnerability means that you have to take your mask off. Correct. Yeah. Right, that you have to lower your guard, that you have to lower your defenses, that you have to take your armor off, uh, whatever metaphor you would like to use. And when you do that, you are you are putting both your heart and your ego on the line. So yeah, I agree. I agree. I couldn't agree more. Either. Yeah, yeah. So we want neither our feelings nor nor our pride to get hurt because as humans, we naturally want to avoid pain. You know, so being vulnerable will will uh, expose us to that to that kind of, of risk. Yes. So, see, uh, you you mentioned something about Dr. Brene Brown, right? You know, and she uh, and to those who are familiar with her work, I mean, she is a social worker who made a career out of out of uh, studying courage, vulnerability, um, shame, and empathy. Uh, she says that there is power in vulnerability. And unfortunately, not all of us uh, take advantage of that power, right? Because of fear. Um, she says that vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity, innovation, and change. And I agree with that. Uh, I also add, I, I may also add that vulnerability is the doorway to intimacy. And this is what I teach the couples, the, the couples that I see. And I say, you need to be to learn to be vulnerable to one another because that is key to your intimacy. Because without intimacy, without vulnerability, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to form meaningful relationships in your life. Sure. So, yeah. So the short answer is fear. That's why it's hard for us to be vulnerable. Mr. you want to add anything to that, Dr. Bryce? Um, well, I, I think it, it's all coming from fear, really. And fear would have different faces, right? 
some mm-hmm. yeah some would cover it up with inferiority or superiority that's still fear some yeah. will trust themselves with anger they want mm-hmm. to be vulnerable and they show an a stance of an angry person in front so that you cannot you know you can knock them off just because they're anger they're angry or that anger is stronger so it's still fear i agree when a person to me um, my my experience every time i see a an angry person i know that that person is afraid he, he's coming out from fear so yes everything is coming really from fear i so agree yeah. all right in yeah. your practice thank you dr brenda do you have examples to show how unregulated emotions can cause pain and suffering Yes, <laughs> I have a lot of that. I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you one that just happened recently, and it's it's fresh in my head. That's why I'm gonna share it with you. Uh, so this is a husband and wife situation, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm just gonna explain to you their their uh, or share with you their exchange. Okay, mm-hmm. so the wife goes like this: um, I'm going upstairs to get ready for bed. That's what the wife says. Um, it's her code for saying. I miss you and I want to cuddle in bed with you. This is something that just, you know, came up later on, but it did not come up just then. All she said was, I'm going upstairs and get ready for bed. Mm -hmm. So the husband says, okay, good night, and continues to play his video game, Mm -hmm. right? So 30 minutes later, the wife texts him and she goes, I cannot wait for you any longer. I'm going to sleep. Now this husband right now, the husband gets rattled and then he texts back and he goes, I'm sorry, babe. I have no idea that you're waiting and I'll be, I'll be right up. So he goes upstairs two steps at a time. <laughs> and when he gets to the bedroom, she was already visibly upset. Mm-hmm. And the wife goes, I waited for you and you did not come. And she starts crying. Mm-hmm. The husband said, I did not know. Wow. I thought you were tired and you wanted to go to bed. Well, the, the wife says, well, you knew that I usually went, want to cuddle before bedtime. So I shouldn't have to tell you. Right. Husband, I'm sorry, babe. I'm here now. I will cuddle with you till you fall asleep. But the wife was already visibly upset, emotionally worked up. Mm-hmm. And she goes, never mind. I hate that I have to tell you what I need. And so what followed was an hour long argument uh-huh. back and forth that resulted in him just grabbing his pillow and then sleeping, that, sleeping downstairs on the couch. So in that situation, both of them ended up feeling frustrated and angry and abandoned because one of them played it safe. And what I meant by that is she tried to avoid unnecessary pain and suffering by not taking an emotional risk and becoming vulnerable with, with her husband. So the, 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 the result was that they did not speak for six days until they came to see me again <laughs> for another session. So that is a, an example. <laughs> because of you know unregulated emotion, they ended up suffering uh, and, and in pain, which was quite unnecessary. Huh. Um, <laughs> well, I have I have heard similar similar stories, right? And and true, if if we just take that step to be vulnerable or to be more open, to just yeah. speak, you know, your language uh, without without masks, without kind of uh, sugar coating or however however you you mask it off, then things will be better yeah. in our relationships, right? Uh, correct. Yeah, that that emotional risking. You know, you have to uh, being vulnerable. Um, otherwise, you know, your relationship is gonna be just a surface kind of relationship where you tiptoe around each other and you know walk on eggshells, which is not a good thing. I also have a question here. I'd like to give. Uh, I'd like to give a chance to this first question. Looking at the future, uh, looking at the future, called uh, asked by Sir Joel, things will not be normal anytime soon, at least for the next couple of years. And online teaching will be more of a norm rather than a special program. 
what can private school administrators do as a program to address the emotional health of teachers? Do you want to take this up, Doc? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, and of course, I can, I can speak from the perspective of a counselor because mm -hmm. I'm not in the, uh, in the uh, academic setting as of now. But I think uh, if I understand the, the question correctly, it, it's talking about how we can support, right? How we can support our teachers and administrators mm -hmm. uh, in this time of uncertainty. And, you know, we're not going back to normal uh, for any time soon. But I think uh, the way I can answer that is through my perspective as a counselor. I think providing uh, access to mental health resources is really, really important. Um, for example, providing access to counselors, you know, mental health advocates, um, providing seminars, for example, okay, and maybe retreats, okay. Also giving time off <laughs> for a, a mental health day, you know. Um, is also a good, a good idea. Maybe even uh, providing some medical assistance if necessary, if somebody needs to, uh, you know, to, to get better, uh, recover, that would be good. Anything that will and can reduce the stress of, of uh, teachers and administrators would, be, would go a long, long way. And of course, the, uh, uh, being able to provide a, an atmosphere of openness where where teachers and administrators can talk openly about how they are doing emotionally, uh, removing or at least reducing the stigma of mental health issues. I think it's going to, you know, to, to help benefit, um, benefit teachers and administration administrators. So yeah, that will be my, my take from that, from, from the counseling point of view. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. I hope that um, helped uh, Sir Joel, right? Yes. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned, I'll, I'll go back to your presentation though, right? Um, you mentioned talk about, you know, reacting and responding. Why are these concepts important in emotional reset? Okay. So when talking about emotional reset, you know, this, this, this concept is crucial because uh, when uh, reaction is the knee-jerk thing that happens, like an impulse, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, you know, when you have an emotional reaction then you, you know, you act on it right away. And that is seldom, seldom mm -hmm. helpful, you know, that's reaction. And then responding is when you take a step back, you right. know. And you know, remove yourself a little bit from the situation and give yourself some time to right. mull over what is going on. The UDA looping that I mentioned earlier is part of right. that program. Uh, and because they say, uh, Dr. Bryce, they say that it takes about 90 seconds for a trigger to go through the whole entire nervous system. So if you just give yourself 90 seconds, wow. you know to reset, right? then you'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to respond much better to the situation instead of react to the situation. Right. So learning the difference is very, very, very important. Correct. And I noticed those people who respond are breathers. They pick, yes. they take deep breaths. And that's very, very important. Um, I, I have to practice that in my meditation. I'm, I'm, I'm practicing uh, the big quiet. I'm part of the big quiet movement, actually. Uh, I, I feel that that's important because responding without really reading a lot about it, just taking that practical step of like taking a deep breath. And I've taught that to my kids as, as early as now, they're six years old, when they're fighting or when they're like into a, a little mess, I would always mm -hmm. tell them like deep breaths, that's important. And then they would respond better. So we are, as leaders, we're totally in a quagmire of different scenarios every now and then, which can perk us up, you know, up and down with our emotions. It's nice to go back to the practical, simple, deep breath practice. Yes, that's very, very basic. 
because then I you think, put more oxygen in your brain and then you're able to think more clearly. And that's what we teach our, our, our clients who suffer from anxiety disorders. You know, that was the number one thing. Breathe. You Breathe. always have to, the brown bag, they say, like when you're having some anxiety attack, it works. Brown it bag. Does. It does. Um, I, I remember like 10, 15, 10, 12 years ago when I was into the BPO, business process outsource, I would have panic anxiety attacks. The real one. Mm. And I would have in my bag the, the brown bag. I would always do that. You know, the carbon dioxide, I needed it. And it helped a lot. Okay. Ah, a lot of questions. Thank you so much. I have Dr. Grace Hasigawa from Tarlac State University for mm -hmm. her question. Okay. Right. Dr. Grace? Hi. My name is Grace Han Hasigawa, and I am a teacher. I am presently with Tarlac State University as a psychology professor. My question is, how can one person turn his emotional challenges or issues into opportunities? Dr. Thank Grace, you. thank you so much for that wonderful question. You know, how can one person change his emotional challenges into opportunities? Right. That is really good because that is a, an example of a growth mindset right there where you are looking at, you know, an adversity, but then you're looking at the possible possibilities for growth in that, in that area. Mm -hmm. So emotions do provide a lot of information into our inner workings and we can either avoid them, suppress them, fight them, or use them to better ourselves. So how can one person change his emotional challenges? Again, by looking at it from a different viewpoint, right? For example, I'm going to give example. If you are afraid of public speaking and you know that to be, you know, you, you, know, you want to be a, a better speaker because that is required of your job, for instance, and you, but you have this fear of public speaking, then the first step is to embrace that deficiency, you know, face it head on, acknowledge it, mm -hmm. because you cannot change what you do not acknowledge. Isn't that right? You acknowledge first that you have that deficiency. And then from that moment on, you take steps to overcome that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, uh, okay, some practical uh, solutions could be that you could join the uh, Toastmasters internationally. Mm -hmm. yeah, something like that, where you can practice speaking in front of one person mm -hmm. and then speaking in two people and then three and then another audience. So in that case, you know, you recognize what your deficiency is and you, you flip that and turn it into an opportunity to better yourself, you know, so you can definitely change the emotional challenges. And also another thing, uh, Dr. Rice, is that, you know, in, in your case where you had a lot of trauma, right, in your life, you, you turn that around and said, and now you're speaking to people about that, you know, and in the way you are able to inspire people that, hey, you know, despite all of the, the traumatic events that happen in your life, you can overcome that. So now you have, you're, you're serving as an inspiration to, to other people. The difficulty that you faced, you know, you turned it into an opportunity for other people to learn from as well. So, yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's <laughs> true. I, I agree. Also, um, you mentioned something about high emotion, about high emotionally or high emotional reactivity and how it is not always a person's fault. I'm, I'm not sure if I get it right, but there's high emotionality, right? Can you elaborate yeah. more in this? Yeah. Um, okay. One of my clients, uh, and I, I said earlier that, you know, she was very distraught about her emotional situation. Like, why am I... She asked me, Dr. Fortune, why am I so emotional? You know, I don't like it. I don't want to be emotional like this. Um, and then, of course, I had to rule several things out. You know, there are some causes, you know, emotions can be caused by certain disorders, like I, I mentioned earlier, conditions that could be causing higher emotional reactions. And I mentioned mood disorders uh, earlier, like major depressive disorder. If you or if you have bipolar disorder, um, it used to be called manic depressive episodes, and you are more prone to to that, you know. Or if you have a personality disorder, you know, right. like borderline personality disorder, uh, people 
BPD people are usually very emotionally dysregulated. They mm -hmm. feel big, 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 big emotions. Right. You know, they have this great sense of abandonment. So that you know, any any uh, comment that you make that they perceive to be, uh, you know, rejection, abandonment, they just they flip right. out. Yeah, I can but, relate to them. I can relate to that really. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So there there's a disorder going on there. Then of course there's PTSD. You mm -hmm. know, people who are suffering from post traumatic disorder, or there's also CPTSD, which is the complex. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, they are more prone to, to anxiety, they're mm -hmm. more prone to, to anger outbursts and things like that because you can trace that back to, to, this, to the condition of PTSD. Hormonal changes, I mentioned that a, a little bit ago, you know, postpartum depression, thyroid issues mm -hmm. also, you know, or um, if you have, um, I think all this, if you are menopausal, <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah, I can relate to that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's hey, related to that. Those who can relate in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Uh, and then, of course, if you have an anxiety disorder, like generalized anxiety, we're always like, oh, on edge. Right. Things like anything can set you off. Or if you have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, well, you know, we, uh, those kinds of things. Or other medical conditions, like if you have, you know, traumatic brain injury, for instance, TBI, or you have imbalances in your brain when it comes, you know, something like that, or even genes, you know, because some of these characteristics can be passed down. So it's not always your fault that you're reacting, you know, in ways that you're reacting. There might be something going on that you need to rule out. So that's one of the, the protocols that I do. You know, you rule out these things first. And then, you know, if you perceive, if I diagnose them to be suffering from any of these disorders, then I refer them to a psychiatrist, you know, psychologist or their primary care doctor so that they can get medication for this one to stabilize, stabilize them. And then we can do therapy with them then. So we work hand in hand with, with uh, doctors, uh, you know, physicians, for all mm -hmm. those things. Right. So if you if you um if you suspect that you may have any of these, my advice is for you to go and see your doctor right away. Mm -hmm. Because you, you can do something about that. For sure. Yeah, if you caught yourself saying, my boss is always angry, oh, maybe time to help. <laughs> yeah. To help, right. Because there are people who are really mad, you know. The, yeah are high strung like mm. I've, I've worked with some people like that and you can tell you can yeah. everywhere is button for them you can just a little trigger their buttons are pushed yes and some people are so good. even even a, you know a, 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 in driving there are people who can just stay calm i'm one of those i've met an accident and i was half smiling <laughs> and my car was total wreck and the nurse who came to rescue the ER nurse, the EMS nurse who came to rescue, was saying, Mom, are you okay? You're still smiling. Mom, your car is wrecked. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, but there are people who would really be so mad. I was I was relating a story of like, um, just a scratch, they, they bumped. There was this collision. It, it bore scratches in both cars. And they had to have these guns. You know, they, yeah, they were, they were both at hand, but this was a real scenario I've seen back in the day. And I said, come on, some people would really have yes. a strong emotional. Oh my God. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, You've heard of road rage, right? That yeah, people... road rage, really. But that, that's, to me, that's not a road rage that just happened there. It's a pent up thing. There's something happening much, much, um, you know, longer okay. than the than the real the real scenario okay yeah anyway yeah. I, I still like to address some more questions if you allow us um Absolutely. there's a very interesting question here it said it, um well anonymous attendee i don't think um we got the name but anyway if the person shuts himself or herself due to excessive emotional pain is emotional reset possible for that person by merely counseling or medication What's your merely but merely by counseling or or, uh, medication. or medications or or it's medication needed. oh 
Yeah, wow, that is a very important question because if if the person is already isolating himself and shutting himself, you know, uh, it seems very, very serious, yeah. right? And of course, like I said earlier, uh, medication and counseling go hand, hand in hand. But it seems like in this situation, there is a dire need for this person to maybe go to the hospital, mm -hmm. become an inpatient at the hospital. Because there they can monitor because, uh, you know, people who shut themselves are extremely depressed. And it seems like this is a situation where the person is extremely depressed, right? Yes. So they, they could be a risk for suicide. Right. And that is something that we, we need to, you know, to address right away. So in this situation, merely by, by uh, you know, counseling or medication, um, maybe they need something more than that. Maybe they can, they, they need to go to a, a facility, for instance, where they can be monitored and where there are in-house psychiatrists and doctors and, and nurses and, you know, counselors who are going to be there to stabilize that person. So emotional reset cannot happen unless, like I said, you cannot see yourself in boiling water. You have to kind of, you know, to make sure that you can, you can, you can stabilize yourself first before the link can work. Thank you. I like this question asked by Miss Australia, and this was uh, directly addressed to you, Doc Brenda. Um, how do we deal with our coworkers who are under our charge when they become so reactive about some directives or tasks that require extra mile on our part? Our team or members of admin is planning to meet some of our coworkers who express emotion, sentiments regarding a task during a meeting, do we just pass up the incident or have a dialogue with them? Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Happens okay. all the time. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> this is an opportunity for growth. <laughs> right, right. Both, both ends of the spectrum, I would say that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's no way if you you uh, you push it or you, you sweep it under the rug, you know, it's, it's still there. Right. And then the tendency for that is that the dirt is still going to keep sweeping it under the rug and then the dirt is going to pile up and then pretty soon you're going to stumble over that, the dirt that you pushed under the rug. You know, the best thing is to have a, a dialogue with that person. Are they, is she talking about coworkers, like a group of coworkers so. or one person? I think so. I, I think a group. Okay. So they're planning to uh, confront this person about maybe the person's behavior? Could be, could be. Why the person is, um, you know, reacting the way that he is reacting. Okay, so um, I don't know if you've heard of the nonviolent communication approach, which mm -hmm. I use, NVC approach by Dr. Marshall uh, Rosenberg. Okay, can you and share more about one, that? Yeah. Yes, yes. In fact, let me, let me pull my, one of my books. Nonviolent way of communication. For just one second. Okay. Uh, see, this is the living the nonviolent communication uh, by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, and this is a way to to bridge gaps uh, between people who are, you know, in conflict. And he actually used he actually used this uh, this strategy to uh, reconcile warring tribes, you know, in mm. different countries. And he has another book of this. He has another one that he wrote. Mm -hmm. Nonviolent communication, yes. And he says there, when you're busy judging people, you have no time to love them. Okay. Mother Teresa said the same thing, right? Yeah, that's right. So in this case, why is this person? You need to be curious, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, instead, of, instead of being furious, I'm you need curious. to be curious. Yeah. About why is this person being reactive? You need to go a little bit beyond and not judge them for how they're behaving. And like you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, right? There's always that's, you know, anger and frustration and irritability. They say that those are actually secondary emotions. There's always something else that drives yes. that. So maybe this person is stressed out. Yes. Maybe he has a problem at home. All right. He cannot handle. Maybe, you know, there has a relationship issue that's going on. Maybe he is disgruntled by whatever is going on at the school. So you need to, you know, find, get more information about that. Instead of addressing the symptom, you go to the root 
cause of that. Right. Right. Okay. So how do you use non non uh, the nonviolent communication approach or MVC? Okay, it has four steps. The mm -hmm. first one is observe. Observation. This is when when you say when, when these two uh, two parties come together again and talk about the issue, right? Yes. Okay. Then they need to come to an agreement about what they are talking about. Yeah. First. So, for instance, this uh, coworker is very reactive. You need to state a fact about what is going on that this person can agree. Mm -hmm. that is happening. Yeah. So they can say something like, we have noticed that the past several times that we have attempted to talk to you, mm -hmm. you know, that you have turned away or you have appeared angry. So mm -hmm. it's very non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. They're non-judgmental and it is based on facts. Right. And then after that, you state your feeling about well, what's going on. So when, whenever that happens, you know, I feel that, you know, we are unable to communicate with you. Or I feel the, right. the next part of that is you state your need. You know, I need us to be able to work well together in this situation. Right. You know? And so, and then at the end, you state your request, which is the last part of the, the NBC process. And you say, would you be willing to talk to us about what might be bothering you? That could right. be a request. Or would you be willing to um, work with us in this issue? So you you put it back on them, you know, instead of making a demand. Right. So again, um, yeah. So that's the nonviolent way of of resolving an issue. It shows empathy first. I, I calm the water. Yeah. I call it the sandwich method. I mean, for from my oh, yeah. trainees, I call it the sandwich method. You affirm the person. I affirm the person first, and then I get into the, my, the meat of of, of of yes. my plight, and then at the end, I put back the other loaf of the, you know, piece of the bread, so the sandwich is served. You know what I mean? Yes, <laughs> right, absolutely. Or this one, All right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Caress, slap, caress. Yeah, caress, slap, caress. Right. Um. In the next five minutes, we'll have close. Thank you so much for. Um, you know, a very engaging, uh, you know, uh, discussion. We have another question. I still have one more video question and one last question that I'll address from the Q&A box. And then after that, we'll be closing. So anyway, yes. it's Good Friday. This could be a good penitence for all of us. Stay a little bit later for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could June. go to lunch at your house. <laughs> I know, I know. Soon, soon when everything's over, when all of this, you know, scare is over. Okay, Dr. Julius Mineses, Jules Mineses, uh, the Vice President for Research and Development of Rizal Technological University is here to ask a question for you. Okay. Hi, I'm Jules Mineses, a teacher from Rizal Technological University. I am tasked to oversee the research and extension programs of the university. My question, how can we maintain our emotional fitness? Oh, wow. That is a really good, good question. Thank you, Dr. Meneses, for that question. Uh, how do we maintain our emotional fitness? Okay, well, emotional fitness entails that we, we train for it, right? You cannot be fit unless you train. So how do you maintain that then? Well, I, I have this uh, cross prostic acronym, <laughs> P I E R S. You know, peers that I, that I, I share with my my clients. So, how do you maintain emotional fitness? Well, you have to balance all of these five things, you know, in order to remain health emotionally healthy. Okay, uh, the the P stands for physical. You know, you need to take care of your physical body first, because if your body is not well, physical, you know, your body, physical body is not well, then your mind cannot be well either. So things that you can do to maintain physical health, you know, go for a run, take your vitamins, eat healthy, go to bed early, get up, move around, change your environment, you know, make your bed so that you're not tempted to go back and sleep in it. Things like that. So the basic, getting back to basics exercising, uh, you know, and all that. 
And then the I stands for intellectual, you know, what are you feeding your mind? You know, are you on social media most of the time? You know, what kind of movies are you watching? Are they nourishing your, your mind? Or are they just making you more anxious or angrier at the world? You know, are you consuming news? You know, a lot. So reading a book, uh, reading a book, watching, you know, attending webinars like this, <laughs> that is actually feeding your mind, right? So if you're familiar with Tony Robbins, you know, he, he shared one time that a teacher told him to guard the door to his mind. And he kept that. He said, guard the door to your mind. And because he thought about that, he used to go to the library to read, you know, books and look where he is right now. You know, he became a very successful person because he filled his intellect with good things. Okay, the E in pairs is, stands for emotional your emotional life. How are you maintaining emotional fitness? Uh, embracing your emotions, for instance, you know, befriending them, shaking hands with them, looking at them, always being aware of, of how you are feeling, journaling your emotions, you know, taking stock or inventory of what triggers you and so on and so forth. That's the emotional part. And then, there is the R in peers, P-I-E-R-S. The R stands for relational. You know, are you maintaining, how is your relationship with other people, you know? So you, you know, hug people with, with masks, of course. <laughs> you have to wear your mask to do that right now. Reach out, you know, phone people that you haven't spoken to in a long time. Embrace humanity. Involve yourself in community. Um, get outside. If you have to declutter your friend list because they're taking too much of your time, you know, uh, you know, then do that. Get rid of toxic relationship in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, only only retain those that are actually helpful to you. You know, uh, and that's not draining your emotional energy. Okay, and then the S in the in the peers is the spiritual, and this this is really really important. And for a, a person of faith like me, you know, this has been very crucial, you know, in, in my, in balancing my, my, my life in general, because I have that anger, you know. Uh, so praying, you know, meditating, uh, going to church community, being in nature, contemplating, going on a retreat, finding solitude, you know, those are all things that can help to maintain your emotional fitness. So if all of these things are balanced and you are, you know, doing all of these things, um, then you can ensure, you can be assured that you will maintain emotional wholeness. So thank you for that question. I like that one. Peers. 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 P-I-E-R-S. I like that. I like that. Uh, this question came a day before the event, um, showing so much interest. Uh, her name is Sabel Martini. I would like to raise the question to the speakers. She said, what necessary steps or assistance must schools provide to their teachers to assure that they will perform well during the home school setup? Ah, okay. Very good question. Quite relevant in uh, what's happening right now with us, you know. Uh, I work from home too, and you know, the isolation that you feel sometimes or you experience can be, you know, can be great. <laughs> yeah, it can be great. So I think uh, my answer to this one is uh, echoes what the answer that I gave the other, you know, the other participant earlier um, about maybe providing access to the teachers. And I will speak again from the perspective of a counselor uh, or a, a mental health specialist. You know, that in th this uh, situation right now, the pandemic situation, stress is pretty high. Right. Anxiety, high depression, you know, anxiety, they're all uh, real. So what necessary steps or assistance must school provide? Okay, number one, again, I will echo what I said, is that, you know, uh, provide, uh, make it normal, uh, make it, uh, easy 
for teachers to talk about their emotional struggles, to talk about their stressors, let's stress them out, you know, remove or reduce the stigma of talking about it. Because a lot of times teachers do not want to come forward with their struggles because of the stigma that's attached to mental health. Yes. So making sure that, you know, the administrators uh, of the school make that you know, be open, the openness to, to talk about this is one. And then again, providing uh, access to mental health resources, like maybe literature, mm-hmm. you know, things to read, uh, providing counselors, um, also providing seminars like this one to improve awareness and to provide tools that they can use, you know, practical tools. And then also giving them generous mental health days. <laughs> I would say generous mental health days, you know, so that when they say I'm, I'm getting burned out, then you can say, okay, you can take a day off. And so not saddling them with too much work is, is also a good idea. Too much homework for teachers <laughs> can be bad for their health. So basically anything that will and can reduce teachers' stress will be very, very helpful. Good. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. There are still questions in the Q&A box. I will be requesting uh, Dr. Brenda to join me in answering these questions eventually later before we close. But right now, I'd like to run a poll for everyone. Please help us out with this information that we have in our poll. All right. Question, um, do you, number one, Polling time, do you feel that the discussion today is relevant for you as an individual and for your school as a whole? Please just click your answer. Yes, certainly. I am not sure. All right. Number two, would you be interested to see the full demo of emotional reset program? Yes, still deciding. Those are your choices. Um, do you have an um, do you have an existing program? that supports emotional well-being and promotes mental health in your organization? Answers, yes, we do. None, but we are interested to have one. Okay, please help us out with these poll questions. Maybe for the next one, um, one or two minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. So we're seeing a very good result of the poll. We are getting 100% for everyone saying that they need it. This is relevant for them. Um, if they're interested, yes, about 84%. If they have an existing program already, yes, they do, right? 60% and 40% still saying yes, I know, but none, but they're interested to have one. All right. Um, we're doing this poll because we'd like to see where we can come in to support you for this emotional reset program that we have created for the school uh, HR responsive program. So yeah, there you go. Thank you so much, everyone. I think I, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for paying us your time. And I hope that this Good Friday reflection uh, that we're having right now through Hero Ed TV has enriched your um, information bank and your knowledge account, right? That's, that's what we always want to, to fulfill and to fill up every time we have episodes at Hero Ed TV because we'd like to create this platform for thriving, right? And to me, there is no greater service that we can do right now than to spend time, find solution, reach out, and know if we can be of help in any way we can, where we are, when we can, and for who we are. So we're just so fortunate because Dr. Brenda Fortune has not just joined us today, but has co-authored and co-designed Emotional Reset Program. We're running different schedules right now for uh, many schools and many corporates in the Philippines. If your school or your organization is in need of this program, we offer it either live uh, session, that's the synchronous for two days. For a synchronous, it could go on as long as a year, it depends on the program that you're looking for. So thank you so much for allowing us to share to you one of um, a valuable solution that we thought will be re- really very helpful for 
you as an individual or for your school. So if you're asking, Verizon is there also a way for me to just enroll as an individual? Yes. We're doing this as part of our research because we'd like to really find out how are our teachers right now dealing with the crisis that we have and how is their emotional fitness? That is important to us. So this conversation is starting that action. So thank you so much. Thank you for allowing allowing us to be part of your Lent reflection. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenda. Thank you for co-piloting. Thank you so much. We have arrived at our destination exactly at 12.30 here in the Philippines. <laughs> so we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're so welcome. And thank you, everybody. These changes will ultimately transform our entire organization. Our organization, men and media, men and never stop. We never stop. We never stop. We never stop. I welcome each of you here in this summit. And I thank you for celebrating your essence with us today.